any language that lets you allocate memory with new or malloc or something like that has to provide some infrastructure that knows which memory is free to be allocated when you want it. This video is about how languages provide that capability. If you find this video useful, please like and subscribe because that helps other people find it. In some languages, the programmer explicitly allocates and explicitly frees the memory. In others, the programmer explicitly does the allocation, but the language infrastructure infers when the program is no longer using memory spaces and frees them for the programmer. That process of figuring out what is no longer in use and freeing it is called garbage collection. Let's talk about that. So the general strategy behind garbage collection is to find all the memory that's in use and put everything else back into the free pool of memory. The question is, how do we find what's in use? Well, there are places in the system where we know things are in use. We call these garbage collection routes. They include things like the call stack, which will point to all the local variables, or static fields of loaded classes, or places like that. So we start at the roots, and then for every pointer that we find, we mark that allocation as being in use. And we chase any pointers that it has to find other things that are in use. After we've marked everything, we do a process called sweep that is basically run through memory and everything that is not pointed to becomes free space. Now, if someone is allocating memory or freeing memory while we're in the middle of trying to chase all of those pointers, we're not gonna get a consistent picture of what is free and what is allocated. So we have to do what's called stop the world. This basically tells everybody, you can't run now. The whole system has to pause while we're doing this marking. The length of that pause is gonna be proportional to how many things are allocated in the system because we have to touch each thing in the system either to mark it as used or eventually to free it. Mark and sweep can lead to fragmentation where we have allocated sections that are spread out across memory and there are empty spaces in between them. If all of our empty space is broken up into these small segments, the problem is that even if you have enough space for a big allocation, each of these small sections might be too small for that big allocation to fit into. One strategy for dealing with fragmentation is called mark sweep compact. We do all of the marking and we do the sweeping and then we eliminate the fragmentation by moving all of the marked regions to the beginning of memory. This is clearly going to make our stop the world longer because we have to copy everything to move it. But it's even harder than that. If you take something that somebody is pointing at and move it, you have to be able to find every pointer that points at it and make them all point at the new location. We don't wanna search all of memory to do this. Instead, we give each allocation a unique ID and give the program that ID, not the actual address. Then the system keeps a table that maps ID to address. For example, if you've ever stopped a debugger in an object-oriented language like Java or c -sharp, you'll see that each object has an object ID. That's essentially the index into a table, and that table knows where the object is. So when we're doing compaction, we move that object from one place to another. All we have to do is update the table with that new address, and everybody will know where that object is. Mark sweep compact is pretty expensive because we have to make three passes through memory. Now that compact phase is gonna copy almost every allocation. Recognizing that, we can eliminate the sweep phase. Instead of mark sweep compact, we're gonna use a strategy called mark and copy. For this, we divide our memory into two regions that we alternate using. And as we mark objects by following the pointers from the garbage collection routes like we did before, instead of just marking them, we copy each one into the other memory region and update the table to point to them there. When we finish with that, everything that's left in the first region is no longer in use and that space is automatically freed. 
and the things in the second region have already been compacted, so we don't have fragmentation. This is, what this essentially does is saves us doing the sweep phase and then a separate compact phase. We just do them both at the same time. The cost of this is that half of our memory is not in use at any point in time. Since that stop the world thing is very disruptive, we'd really like to find strategies for how to minimize the length of time that things are stopped. One strategy is divide memory into different sections and to pay attention to what's called the generational hypothesis. The idea of the generational hypothesis is that most objects become unused very soon after they're allocated. If you think about your code, everything that you use only inside a method, like every local variable, just gets used for a really short period of time. We allocate the space for it and very quickly stop using it. So there's a whole lot of objects that get used very quickly and thrown away. Most of the objects that last longer than that last a really, really long time. They're things that maintain the core state of our system, and they're in memory kind of almost forever. So we have these two different groups, one that survives a very short amount of time and one that survives a very long amount of time. If we separate those groups and collect them differently, we can make the stop the world time much shorter. Most of the time, when you do garbage collection, you do it on just the short-term objects. That usually frees up enough space because we have thrown away a lot of them. We only garbage collect the long-term objects if the short-term garbage collection doesn't free enough space for us. Objects get moved from the short-term area to the long-term area after they've been around for long enough. Usually, that means they've survived a certain number of garbage collection cycles. One thing we need to worry about is what happens if we cross generations. If I'm doing a short-term garbage collection and I find a reference that references into the long-term area, do I need to keep following the pointers from there? Can long-term objects point at short-term objects? Well, if I'm using a language like Java or C++, where objects are mutable, then I have to keep looking because there's a chance that one of those long-term objects has been modified and points at one of the things that's still in the short-term area. However, if you're working in a functional language like Haskell, where objects are not allowed to be modified after they're created, then once something has gotten into long-term section, there is no possibility that it points at a short-term object because all of the short-term objects were created after the long-term objects. This means that in functional languages, short-term garbage collection can quit following more pointers when it finds the pointer that goes into the long-term area. That can make garbage collection a lot faster in those languages. Java takes this one step further and has three generations. There's a brand new area, and then a survivor area, and then a tenured area. When you allocate something, it gets allocated in the brand new area. There are more details about what the brand new area is, but this is just an introduction, so I'm leaving those details out. I'll make another video about the details of Java's garbage collection. The next generation is called the survivor generation, and it actually has two spaces. At any point in time, you're using either survivor one or survivor two. When short-term garbage collection happens, we do mark and copy. That copies the in-use things in the brand new area and in the currently in-use survivor area into the other survivor area. And we count how many times we did that um, for each allocation. Things stay in those survivor spaces until they've gone through enough garbage collection cycles that eventually they get moved into the tenured area. So if you survive enough garbage collection cycles, we think you're going to be around for a very long time. Garbage collection comes for free in most of the systems that have it. So why is it important that you know about it? Well, the first thing is you need to know about that stop the world pause and how the way that you're using memory might affect how many times that stop the world pause happens. And when it happens, how long and disruptive it's going to be. The second thing is there are parameters that you can manipulate that allow you to control garbage collection. In Java, you can actually pick between different garbage collection algorithms, and you can specify parameters for how those algorithms run. For example, 
You can specify how many times something has to sit in Survivor before it gets moved to the tenured space. You can say how big Survivor should be or how big the tenured space should be. So the reason to understand the philosophy and strategies of garbage collection is so that as a developer, you can tune the garbage collection that you get for free so that your system survives those stop the world things with the least disruption possible.